So 12 of those 18 locations, as they say, rank uh, among the world's premier end Pleistocene archaeological sites where the younger di- younger why the YD where the YDB marks a hiatus in human occupation or major changes in site use. Our results are consistent with melting of sediments to temperatures greater than 2,200 degrees centigrade. We converted that to Fahrenheit, uh, I think it was last episode, and discovered it was just a little under, I think, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 3,900 and something. Hot enough that if any of us were subjected to that temperature, we would probably not survive. Our results are consistent with melting of sediments. Melting of sediments, see? So sediments, this is talking about actually melting the sediments of the ground, right? Uh, By thermal radiation. Now, if we refer back to Tunguska, remember, aerial burst, tremendous pulse of heat, um, thermal radiation striking the ground. Remember the Libyan desert glass. Okay, the Libyan desert glass, you've got this pulse of thermal radiation, incredibly hot thermal radiation, once it intersects the ground, like if it's in the desert region, it's basically it melted the desert floor and turned it into a sheet of molten glass. Now, that's a, that's a very interesting phenomenon. That's not something you see every day. As they said, their results are consistent with the melting of sediments to temperatures greater than 2,200 degrees centigrade by the thermal radiation one, and the other by air shocks produced by passage of an extraterrestrial object through the atmosphere. They are inconsistent with volcanic, cosmic, and when I say cosmic, I'm just talking about the, they're using the term to represent just the slow, gentle, consistent rain of small micro particles that, that, you know, descend to earth every day. But of course, with no virtual, you know, awareness on the part of people or anybody, because, you know, it's such a, it's a, it's such a, a minuscule phenomenon, but they do. I mean, there are cosmic particles that, that, you know, regularly rain down upon the earth, but of course they don't trigger anything catastrophic. So they're saying that, that, that the, um, proxies that they're finding are inconsistent with volcanoes. They've looked at that and they're not the same. The cosmic, they've looked at that, not the same. Anthropogenic, they've looked at that, not the same. Lightning, they've looked at that. You know, lightning can produce fulgurites, right, which are lachetelierite, right, which which are very similar. But there's also very distinct differences, and we haven't talked about those, but but there are. And they've looked at those differences, and these things are not consistent with something produced by lightning strikes. But you do have to wonder, you know, if lightning strike would cover four continents. Um, now I know the electric universe people are probably going to imagine such a thing, but, but there is really no consistent coherent body of information that would support an event like that. Right. However, we do know that there are comets. We know that comets break up. They produce byproducts. They produce swarms of debris those swarms of debris eventually are, are, are meteor streams. Earth crosses those meteor streams. Those things hit the Earth. We know all that, right? So we can't just sidestep all that and, and, and invent a, an exotic alternate explanation because all of that is well documentable. You can find the meteors. You can find the pieces of the meteors, right? Well, we're not going to get into that. So also they're inconsistent with orthogenic. Auth- that's spelled A-U-T-H-I-G-E-N-I-C, orthogenic, which basically means formed in place, right? So it's imp- the things that they're finding are inconsistent with all of the alternatives. That's the point. So they say at 12.8 thousand years ago, an estimated 10 million tons of spherules were distributed across 50 million square kilometers. So 50 million would be uh, what they say, divide by 2.6. That would be uh, right at uh, one, about 19, yeah, about 19 million square miles. 
Now, wow. as we said, this is in 2013. So the the geographical range of these uh, of this phenomena has been extended since then. Well, then I think that we would have to also likewise uh, expand the mass of this material that was distributed over the Earth uh, accordingly. Goes on to say that impact related spherules have long been considered one of the most distinctive proxies in support of an impact hypothesis. However, despite increasing evidence for YDB peaks in impact spherules, their presence and origin remain disputed. In the latest example of this dispute, dispute Boslo et al. stated that, quote, magnetic microspheral abundance results published by the impact proponents have not been reproducible by other workers. Now, referring essentially to the study by Suravel, which has been qu quoted over and over and over again, right? Okay, we have been saved from the heresy. Send out the, you know, send out the presses to say that, you know, we've been saved from the heresy. The impact hypothesis has been discredited, so we don't even need to think about that. Now we're not getting, we're, we, we've averted another intrusion of the cosmic domain into our daily lives by suppressing, by, by, by getting rid of this idea that Earth might have been impacted on a major scale, a mere 12 or 13,000 years ago. The authors, referring to Boslo and others, neglected to cite, conveniently, nine independent spheral studies on two continents shown in figure one, and we can, I think I have figure one here, that reported finding significant YDB spheral abundances. As summarized in high profile, previously published paper by Israde, Israed et al., Bunch et al., and Le Compte et al. The nine additional sites are located in Arizona, Montana, New Mexico, Maryland, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Mexico, and Venezuela. Now, that's where they had been found as of 2013. In response to such claims, we here present the results of one of the most comprehensive investigations of spherules ever undertaken to address questions of geochemical and morphological characteristics, distribution, origin, and processes involved in the formation of YDB spherules. They then go on to say, in another study, Pinter et al. claimed to have sampled the YDB layer at a location, quote, identical or nearly identical, end of quote, with the location reported by Kennett, who uh, did one of the, the first studies, uh, in-depth studies on the spherules, as part of three studies that reported finding no YDB spherules or nanodiamonds. However, the published universal transverse Mercator coordinates that were in those papers, right, reveal that their purported continuous sequence is actually four discontinuous sections. These locations range in distance. Now, get this, okay? So here's the Kennedy team. They go out, they sample the Younger Dryas boundary at this particular location. They go through all the protocols that we talked about before, all of those very stringent protocols that you have to follow. We went through, I think, four or five different deviations, right? The one, the, and here's the, but here's the main one we didn't even mention, okay? As, as Whitkey and his uh, colleagues are pointing out here, the published universal transverse Mercator coordinates reveal that as far as the, the, the Pinter study, their purported continuous sequence is actually four discontinuous sections. These sections range in distance from the site investigated by Kennett et al. by 7,000 meters. So 7,000 meters, that is four, over four miles away. Okay, so here's the site. They're, they're, they're going to go in there and extract this. This is four miles away from the site that Kennett took his samples from, where they found microspherals and nanodiamonds, right? The other three sites that they used, one of them was 1,600 meters away, one of them was 165 meters, and one was 30 meters, so basically 100 feet away, right? Furthermore, 
this sampling strategy raises questions about whether Pinter et al. sampled the YDB at all and may explain why they were unable to find peaks in YDB magnetic spherules, carbon spherules, or nano diamonds. Well, yeah, so if you're looking in the wrong damn place, you know, and, 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 and again, as we talked about, you know, this is a very thin layer where these things are, are concentrated, right? So your aliquot has to be adequate or, or your, you know, because these things are going to be measured in parts per billion, right? So if you don't, if your sample is, is too small, you might overlook it, right? Then the, the sieve size, remember the sieve size, because these things are very tiny. So you've got to use a, a, a sieve with very small aperture in order to filter those things out because it's, it's the idea, you know, if you're, you're looking for a particle and it's, and it's hidden within a, 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 a mass of a couple of hundred other particles, it's still going to be a hell of a lot easier to, to locate than if it's in a pile of 10 or 20,000 other particles, you see. So the sieve size was, was a big factor. By, by not, you know, concentrating the, the microspherals to, to uh, um, densities enough that they could actually be found. So that was, you know, a, a, another factor in why they did not find the microspherals. Okay. Then they published and we didn't, we were not able to see here. And here's how it worked. We were not able to replicate the findings of Firestone and Kennett and others. And interestingly, and I think I've got it right here. Uh, I might pull it up in a minute if I, if I run across it, which I might, but you see some of the headlines in some of the uh, mainstream media saying this experts disprove cosmic impact. No, literally that's what the, the experts have come in and they've weighed in and they've disproven the impact hypothesis. Mainstream right. media for you, right? As uh, Yeah, as though Kennett and those guys are not experts. Right, as if Whitney and Bunch and Mahaney <laughs> yeah, and, and, and all of the rest of Firestone, all of them, they're not experts. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, God. Okay, so they go on to say the analysis of 771 YDB objects presented in this paper strongly support a major cosmic impact of 12.8 thousand years ago. This conclusion is substantiated by the following. Spherules and SLOs, which are the scoria-like objects, and we may have not talked about those, but we, we, we can come back to those. Um, the slows, SLOs, scoria-like objects, also a result of, of heat. Okay, Spherules and SLOs are widespread at 18 sites on four continents. Two, display large abundance peaks only at the YD onset at approximately 12.8 thousand years ago, are rarely found above or below the YDB, indicating a single rare event, and four, amount to an estimated 10 million tons of materials distributed across 50 billion square kilometers of several continents, thus precluding a small localized impact event. They are the morphologies and compositions of these spherules are consistent with an impact event because one, uh, compositionally and morphologically similar to previously studied impact materials, okay? They closely resemble terrestrial rock compositions, which shows that whatever the this energetic process was, it was able to inject large amounts of continental material into the atmosphere, okay? Often display high temperature surface texturing. They can then also, you know, the, 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 the silicon dioxide inclusions, which is a uh, lachetaliorite, they're often fused to other spherules by collisions at high temperatures. We looked at some of those images last week, didn't we? I think we did um, occasionally display high velocity impact cratering. I, I have a question real quick about yeah. the idea that, that these objects are um, terrestrial in composition, but we're also talking about the idea of air bursts. So yeah. does that mean that these, that the air bursts are being caused by terrestrial like objects, like that their composition is also terrestrial like, like I know it wouldn't be the same. Well, yeah, or, are we, or we're looking at it. We're looking at both, basically. We I think we're looking at both. Impact. See, okay, yeah. I think what we're ultimately going to see here 
is that and one of and, and one of the legitimate criticisms of the critics is they're saying, wait a minute, on the one hand, you're saying it's commentary, on the other hand, you're saying it's iron, on the other hand, you're saying it's chondritic. Come on, you yeah. guys, you can't make up your mind. So get out of here, you know. I think what we're looking at is an encounter with a heterogeneous swarm disintegrating from a comet whose nucleus is anything but homogenous. And the byproducts of that disintegration are running the range, uh, the compositional range. And so we're looking at hundreds, perhaps thousands of impacts on multiple scales, uh, which could include air bursts, land impacts, oceanic impacts, and glacier impacts. Right. So once you, you start, <laughs> once you start, and this is really, if you have a, if, if it's a swarm, and Earth is encountering a swarm, yeah, you're going to expect, like just like it says here, here they're finding this stuff distributed over 50 million square kilometers. Now, question is, is that going to be the result of a major localized impact event and then the distribution of the impact proxies, say, by atmospheric transport? Could be, particularly when you're dealing with this, the scale of this. But what you would have to do is find other proxies. For example, if you find melted rocks there, you know, let's say in Syria, well, that's not going to be from an impact over North America. Right. You might find microspherals there that might have been uh, transported through stratospheric currents around the planet and then, you know, precipitated out. Yeah. But you're not going to find other kinds, you're, you're not going to find the full suite of proxies and including evidence of you know scoria like objects again also display evidence of of being subjected to extremely high temperatures just like the microspherals 